My name is Aaron Ellison. I'm a senior ecologist at Harvard University's Harvard Forest here in Massachusetts in the United States of America. Today we're standing out here in a bog that we call Tom Swamp where we're surrounded by carnivorous plants as well as more edible things like blueberries. I became a scientist because I'm really interested in the natural world. What goes on outside? What is happening in the world around us. And I really got interested in this when I was a small child, maybe in third grade when I was about eight years old, I really wanted to be a lepidopterist. That is someone who goes out and collects butterflies and moths. And fortunately, my teachers and my parents were very supportive and very enthusiastic about um, this career goal for a small child and encouraged me all along the way. So I call myself an ecologist, and ecologists study the science of how the natural world works. As an ecologist, as a scientist, we collect a lot of data, and we have to analyze those data. And so I'm also very interested in how data get analyzed, and the people who analyze data are called statisticians, and I'm also, in part, a statistician. In fact, I've written an entire textbook on on statistics that uh, is used quite widely in, in classes around the world. At the same time, I really like to think of myself as a natural historian. I just like understanding how things work. And so probably my biggest interest is just sitting in the field and watching uh, the different plants and animals interact. And so part of that is our interest in ants. And in addition, I've also written a field guide to the ants that we have here in New England. For my entire, entire career as a scientist, and I've been doing ecological science as a, as a career for over 30 years, my main interest has been on how ecological systems, the, these natural systems around us, how they respond to different kinds of disturbances, whether these are disturbances caused by people or by natural events, such as windstorms or ice storms or hurricanes. Um, and then after those disturbances, how these ecological systems get put back together again. Um, and so back in the, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, my colleagues and I were studying this question in Belize in Central America in the tropical coastal forests uh, that line the, line the coasts of the, of the barrier reef there and of the, of the country. But we were only able to work in Belize for about four months every year. We had to teach at home, and we'd, we didn't live in Belize. We lived here in North America, so we'd be going back and forth, and we were missing key events in the reconstruction and restoration of these ecological systems that we just couldn't, we couldn't figure out how to see. So we started looking around for a similar ecological system closer to home, something that uh, grew in our own backyard, something that uh, was subject to periodic disturbances and something that we could watch all the time. And carnivorous pitcher plants fit that bill really nicely. They make a whole lot of different kinds of uh, pitchers that are these tubular leaves that they make every year. And the leaves open up and they fill with water. Um, and then these leaves are colonized and inhabited by a whole range of small uh, animals, protozoa, larvae of flies and mosquitoes, mites, and bacteria. And they work together as this entire um, little ecosystem that we can do experiments on. And as you can see here, there are hundreds of these things right in a very small area, and there are thousands or tens of thousands of them here in this, in this entire bog. So if we take a look inside of one of these leaves, we can see the creatures that live in these things. Let's see. So here are a couple of mosquito larvae. The larvae of these mosquitoes, these mosquitoes live only in pitcher plants. Their larvae uh, do their entire life cycle inside of a pitcher plant, and they overwinter in the frozen water uh, in, these, in these plants. Let's see what else we've got in here. A few more mosquito larvae come pouring out. So there are about eight or ten mosquito larvae in these. And there's all the little pellets, which is all the what's all that's left of the ants that have been dissolved 
uh, in the pitcher plant and broken down by the bacteria and the midges. We're going to open this leaf up entirely and see what else is inside of here. A couple of flies that have been collected that are broken down. And then all the way down at the bottom is where all the prey gets dissolved. There's another creature down here. This is a the larvae of the pitcher plant midge right here wriggling around and then this is where all the nutrients get absorbed by the plant right in here and it gets taken up by the plant used to make this entire green leaf. So this is the round leaf sundew. This is the same species of sundew that Darwin studied and wrote about in maybe half of his book on insectivorous plants. Let's lift it up and we'll get it in the sun where you can see why it's called a sundew because it's the sunlight reflects on the leaves, on the glands, the sticky glands at the end of each leaf that are very attractive to insects that often will be, uh, will come to these very bright iridescent globules of, of mucilage and when they touch it, they get stuck on it. And so you can see even on my fingertip, It'll grab and pull a little bit. I think the most important thing to me personally about doing this is simply the, the opportunity to do the endless exploration and curiosity-driven research that I'm allowed to do in my work. I get to travel all over the world. I get to go to interesting places and study things that other people don't think are very important. Uh, Evelyn Hutchinson, one of the founders of of ecology, the discipline of ecology, once said that this kinds of work we do, no matter how unpromising, no matter how strange it seems, sometimes turns out to be really, really important. And so having the opportunity to do things that turn out to be really important seems like it's really valuable to me. Charles Darwin was one of the greatest natural historians and ecologists and scientists that we've had in the last several hundred years. Darwin was a really keen observer of nature and he was really a very careful experimental biologist. And so the way he combined looking at how the world works and putting that together uh, with careful experiments is a model that many of us continue to work with as a, as a way of doing science today. More importantly, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is probably the most important theory uh, that undergirds all of biological science now in the 21st century. A lot of us who study ecology and evolution today are fond of saying that we're still all basically Darwin's technicians. So Darwin wrote a book that, about carnivorous plants that he called insectivorous plants because really most carnivorous plants mostly eat insects. And the importance of, of this book really cannot be underestimated. Darwin showed for the first time using, again, this very clever combination of observations and experiments that these plants really did trap and consume and eat and digest insects and then use the nutrients that were that were inside of them. People continue today to look for new examples of carnivorous plants and when we have one that we think is a new kind of carnivorous plants we still use the methods and, and protocols that Darwin developed for demonstrating conclusively that plants are carnivorous to study these plants today. So that's not a bad legacy for someone after 150-200 years.